here's the big topic of tonight, and I'm going to talk about multiple things inside of this. The big topic tonight is why did Jesus come when he came? Why did he come then? So I want us to look at that together. And we're going to be in some scripture in Galatians chapter 4. If I hadn't already said that, let me just say that now. Galatians chapter 4. And we'll look at some passages, um, mainly this passage, but we'll jump around in some scripture. But we'll really look at Galatians chapter 4. And I'm going to read it, and then we'll have prayer together. Here's what it says starting in verse 1. I'm reading from the NIV text, the New International. What am I saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to the guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, now he's talking, starting to talk about why Jesus came or when he came. And he uses this terminology, when time had become, in the Greek text, it literally means when time became so pregnant that birth had to happen, that Jesus had to burst forth on the scene. Watch this. But when time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God's Spirit, God sent His Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who, who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Let's pray together. Father, thanks for the evening. Lord, we are so excited about the potential of taking new ground for life, for babies. Father, for the pro-life cause. Uh, Lord, these hearings that started today with our Supreme Court uh, for, from the ban that uh, Mississippi had had on abortions. And Father, Texas, last month, as they heard those arguments as well, it could be that at sometime in 2022, in the spring, maybe even just before they wrap up their session, Lord, before summer, right at the beginning of summer, Lord, there may be new ground taken for, for pro-life. Lord, we know that you're for life. You are the giver of life. You're the one that decides when life is to end not us. And Father, help us to, to bow to that, to your sovereignty there. But Lord, how we pray that you would accomplish new ground in these United States. Lord, just the horrors that are going on in China with the limitation of children, the forced abortions that are happening there. Now, uh, Lord, into the uh, three or four hundred million that we even just know about. Lord, it's sad enough to say that we're about at 60 million now here in the U.S. since 1973. Lord, we pray that Roe versus Wade will go down. And Father, I pray that uh, you would at least produce a hybrid out of this, that there is some new ground that is more for life Lord, science stands with us uh, so clearly. The, the more evidence that they examine, the clearer it is that that's a baby. That's a little human being in that, in that mother's womb. So, Father, we pray over that. Lord, we want to pray for uh, other needs in the life of our church. And, Father, we just pray and ask that you would minister, Lord, to different needs we have that uh, are coming up. We especially pray over the city council meeting that's on December the 14th, Lord, that we may have a vote that evening uh, for our buyer on the, uh, 
the, the, the plotting of the property back here, the plan, and Lord, that that would go through. And Lord, we would give you praise uh, to just see this uh, wrapped up. And Father, we can move on with our vision plans for 2022. And Lord, we just pray that you would just bless us with a great, bring a gift to Jesus Sunday and even a Global Impact Sunday this week with all of our Global Impact Ministries. Lord, bless them. And Lord, give them great liberty as they're here to talk to us. Lord, may we be, may the Oaks be more and more of a mission-minded church locally and Lord, throughout the world. We thank you for these organizations that can just help us do things that we simply cannot do uh, here locally as well as around the world. And Father, we just pray that uh, this time of wrap up in your kingdom, that you would bring all that are going to come to you. And Lord, we look forward to the day that we can all go home and the job is done. And we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's talk about Christmas stuff and unique Christmas stuff, all right? Stuff that you might not hear in a regular message. So we're going to start with a few things. We read that passage in Galatians chapter 4, and it uses that terminology in verse 4. It says, when the fullness, when the fullness of time had finally arrived. Well, why, did, why didn't God send Jesus uh, a thousand years before that? Why didn't he send him when Moses was walking the earth? Why, why didn't he just start and send him back right after Adam and Eve messed up and uh, sin abounded? And why didn't he just send Jesus then? Have you ever thought about that? I want you to really think about that. I'm going to tell you several things tonight that I believe are reasons that God waited until when he did. So I want you to look at several factors with me tonight. You know, the Christmas story is just not a story. It's God intervening in history to save all of us from our sin. And that's exactly what the story tells us. So let's go to verse 4, Galatians chapter uh, 4. And we're in verse 4. And it says, when the time had fully come, when the earth... Uh, and time had come to its full pregnancy, and it was time to deliver the baby. And I mean the baby, the Christ child. Jesus was sent forth. But why did it happen during this time of the Roman Empire, during this time where Israel was, was, was pretty minimized? Why did it happen then? So first of all, let's talk about a couple of things. Jesus came in the what of time? The fullness of time. Somebody said the nick of time, right? Just in the nick of time. Well, he came, didn't he? And he came to save us from our sins. I want you to think about what's said in that passage. We're going to look at it and take it apart and look at it pretty good. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. Born of a woman, born under the law. And then we'll look at the rest of it here in a minute. December 25th. I have a 364 chance, really 65, that I'm right on what I'm getting ready to say. December 25th is not Jesus' birthday. Not. What's the evidence? Well, let me give you some evidence, okay? A little history lesson. So, you can go back. There are some people that believe Jesus was born in the fall, and they tie it to the shepherd story because they wouldn't be watching. They may not be out watching through the night over their flock in the wintertime. But let me share with you a couple of things that we do know. These are historically accurate things that we can document, all right? And those are always the safe things to talk about because we know these are true. So, surprise, surprise, it's not uh, December 25th. Um, if you've ever talked to a Jehovah's Witness and they get on Christians about all of our celebrations 
and what we do and how we do it, they love to go after this one because they're like, they've got some history on their side in their argument. And they say, you know, that was a pagan holiday. Well, guess what? They are correct. It was a pagan holiday in the Roman Empire. We'll talk about it here in just a second. But uh, in the early centuries, we do know that Christmas, even though it wasn't very focused on, because the early church focused on what part of the story? The resurrection. The crucifixion and the resurrection were paramount because this was the end result. Jesus bled, the sinless, stainless Son of God, bled for us. Then he suffered in our place. Then he died in our place. And then he rose again. And the early church so emphasized that message that Christmas, or the birth of Christ, got kind of a little lost in the story. It wasn't focused on. We do know that early on, in those first couple of centuries, could be something to this. We can't really historically document it because we simply, here, here's what scholars know. We don't know. We don't know when Christ was born. Let me say that again. We don't know. I, I will hear somebody on the radio or I'll pick up a book and I'll, they'll be saying, oh, it was in the fall of the year. Uh, it might have even been during Yom Kippur. And they, they've got these reasons they'll tie to it, to Jewish holidays and so forth and things in the Old Testament that are very obscure. But the reality is January the 6th was a celebrated time that there were the first, this is after the first century, into the second century, and a little into the third century, January the 6th was a celebrated time for Christmas, for the birth of Christ. It just wasn't the big deal that the resurrection story was. So again, the church just didn't emphasize it. So what happened during the early 300s? There is a figure that comes on the scene. He first is persecuting the church and then he's converted himself. He's the Roman emperor, Constantine. And Constantine made a lot of decisions about the church and tried to tie it to the Roman uh, Empire, their government system as much as possible. He did not really believe in separation of church and state. He was, he kind of lumped them together. But in 336, he made a proclamation. And when the emperor spoke, guess what? It was law. His word was final. There were many Christians that were starting to practice during that whole time. And you got to remember, the Roman Empire is vast. It's, this is the zenith of it. It's, it's huge. Uh, it covered a large portion of the, the Mediterranean seaboard around the Mediterranean Sea. And, you know, we think of, of it being centered in, in Rome, and it was. But, man, they had battled and taken ground and there are all kinds of reasons that God chose to come in this time. And I want to share some of those. But there was a pagan holiday in the uh, Latin. It is called uh, Saturnella. And Saturnella was uh, a holiday that had to do with the winter solace and days starting to become longer in the northern hemisphere. So Santanella would have this season of a week that they would celebrate that now the days are starting to get longer, that there's going to be more daylight, they will get longer, and it was celebrated. Now, here's what's interesting about this holiday. It started on this week celebration every year on December 19th. Guess what day it concluded? Any guess? on December 25th. That was the conclusion day. Now, it was kind of a wild pagan celebration. But let me share with you some of the things they were doing and see if you think any of these things have stayed with Christmas. 
especially the secular version of Christmas. They had parades, special music that went along with the holiday. They had gift giving. Lighted candles were a part of this celebration. And even green trees. Wow, how about that? Well, we'll talk about Christmas trees because they do have a very interesting place in uh, church history, especially during the Reformation. So we'll, we'll bring some light to that. So let's talk about, you know, obviously if Constantine said, Jesus' birthday is December 25th, signs with his, his, uh, uh, his pen or his quill, dipping it in ink, and that was that. Was that. And it was the 25th. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church <laughs> sure advanced that idea as it continued to develop after this period. Well, let me share with you some things that I believe are big reasons why God had Jesus come at this time. Let's look at them. So there were several things. Jesus came when there were governmental systems that had become more advanced than they'd ever been before. One of the gifts of the Roman Empire was a highway system. They had created roads that people could really travel on all throughout the entire Roman Empire. So there, there were roads that went all the way from Spain. We're talking about the end of the northern side of the Mediterranean and went down into the Holy Land. So you're, you're talking about a vast area of a network of highways that we basically just didn't have. We didn't have the technology or we didn't have the, the, the system and the money uh, to put something like this together. So highways is your first blank there, highways. So there was also an ease of travel. Travel was just much easier because you can make much more time on these new roads. I mean, these weren't like highways out here we have in DFW, like our interstate, uh, but they were very nice roads compared to what they had been used to traveling on. Usually there was basically a path, and that path, as the summer uh, weeds and so forth would progress, uh, would grow, and they would, you know, there might be somebody to trim or just walking on it might, might uh, reduce that. But these were roads that wagons could go on and uh, things could be pulled. Third, communication became a gigantic plus for Jesus coming. Why? Because Greek was nearly universal during that time of the Roman Empire. They also spoke Latin. Latin was pretty common as well. But now people could talk to each other. There was some common language, just like we have even in the days of Israel during this period of time. Under the Roman Empire in the first century, we know this. We know that many of the Jewish people not only spoke Hebrew, they could speak some Aramaic, and we have the results in our Bible just a little bit. And we also know that they could speak Greek that mostly most people could speak Greek. Why? Because it was insisted upon by the Roman Empire. It was like being in their school system and you were gonna learn what they, what they were shelling out. Communication, big, big deal. There was also a growing belief, fill that in, growing belief in one God. Now in Roman, uh, if you've looked into the Greek, uh, Greek mythology or or even in the Roman gods, there were multiple gods, but there was this trend that had been going on for over a century that there may just be one God and there may be sub-gods underneath them. So you had this move from being kind of um, where it was, um, you know, a, a, a single deity that may exist. And so that set the frame for the teachings about Yahweh God and how he is one. And then back in Israel, there was something that happened. It, went, it took place over about a 150 year period 
Um, some scholars think it went about 200 years, but you can trace it for about 150 years. The Sadducees, who didn't believe in any resurrection, were more dominant than the Pharisees. They were the big boys on the religious block. But as time passed, the 150 years or so prior to Jesus coming on the scene, the Pharisees teaching became much more predominant and became the bigger group. Now, what did the Pharisees believe? What did the Sadducees believe? Well, one of the chief uh, doctrines that they had during that time is the Sadducees didn't believe there was a resurrection of man, of humans. But guess what the Pharisees believed? They believed that there was a resurrection. You see how that would be so important that that was preparation right before Jesus came to the earth. Now, why is that such a big deal? Well, if nobody believes in a resurrection, you're not going to have ready listeners. If people do believe that you can be resurrected and your body will join your spirit and your soul in heaven, they start teaching more of a triune being. You, your, your body goes to the grave, but your spirit and soul exit. And the Pharisees were teaching this as primary theology to the Jewish community, preparing them for one who comes in the wilderness and says, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and he's baptizing people. And lo and behold, he's a cousin to the Messiah that is coming, huh? Uh, from Elizabeth. So, it's all set up for when the Lord would have Jesus come. The road system allowed travel for the message of the gospel to travel, the Roman highway system. The Greek language, some Latin, and again, because all, always the, the Hebrews were you know, speaking Hebrew, but they were forced to learn Greek. And it was the common language of the culture of most of the Roman Empire. So now we've got a common language where the gospel can travel through a common tongue. You follow me? So there was the highways, travel, ease of travel. And there was also a common language. Big, big deal. Why is that a big deal? Because you've got to be able to speak to people. Now, did God take care of that on the day of Pentecost? He sure did, didn't he? he uh, every dialect they all heard in their own tongue uh, on the day of Pentecost. So obviously God had that planned to see them all come to the Lord. And you've had some people that will say this. They'll, they'll say, man, if I could, and I've had people say this to me in witnessing encounters. If I could just have lived when Jesus walked the earth and I heard for myself and I saw I could believe. I could believe. Well, the Bible tells us that we are extra blessed if we believe the message of those that went before us. And it is a blessing to believe. And didn't Jesus really reveal himself to you anyway? He sure did to me. I'm sure he did to you too. Didn't he reveal who he was to you? Even though that may have been over 2,000 years ago that he came. Well, I want you to look at a couple of phrases here. And I want you to go to, again, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. And I think they probably need a handout back there. Don't you? You all want a handout? They came in a little later. You might want to get them a handout, hubby. That might be dad. That might be a good ministry for you tonight. He's coming. All right. I want you to look at these three phrases, okay? And I know I'm giving you a lot of stuff to write down tonight. I, I probably should have done the TV screen back here behind me so you had a lot of answers filled in. You're, you're going, how do you spell that? Because you probably haven't heard it before, or if you've heard it, you've forgotten it by now. He uses that language, the fullness of time. And as I said, um, 
you, you can look at some interesting statements in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 3, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 has a real interesting statement about time. There's an example there uh, about time. But God tells us here that when time, and literally in the Greek text, it's, it's when uh, time itself, picture her as a woman, all right? Let's just use that as an analogy. It's when she is, she is right there and birth pains have started and the birthing process of sending the Christ child. Now, we know that was the Virgin Mary, but for the use of an analogy, let's use time as the woman, okay? And when, when time was so fully pregnant that it couldn't wait any longer and all the systems were right, I mean, don't, don't we trust God that he knows what he's doing all the time? We do, don't we? And the longer you walk with the Lord, the more you just know. Even if you, can't, you don't know what's going on, you can't figure it out. You're like, God, what are you doing? I don't get it. I don't understand why you're doing this right now. But we've learned to trust him, haven't we? That he knows best. When we say God the Father knows best, we really know he knows best. And this is the time that God sent forth his son when time was fully ready. And I do think that these are some very practical reasons. I had an entire seminary class with uh, Timothy George, um, or I'm sorry, with David Dockery, um, who now is president, I think, of uh, one of the schools in Tennessee. But uh, I, such a brilliant mind, but he was, uh, he, he spent an entire class teaching us about the fullness of time. I mean, the class, that's what the class was on, is just this passage nothing else and we studied it from all kinds of angles and it was fascinating and uh i if i if i could remember just a hundredth of what uh, you know i i had studied and learned then in fact i pulled out some of my notes uh last couple of days for 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 tonight the fullness of time so this was god's ordained time for jesus to come into the world now it would have been neat if he showed up in DFW in 2000 and, and you know, it'd been really neat if he had showed up in 2020, wouldn't it? About March. Uh, so he could explain all that to us, right? The pandemic that we still, and, and isn't, it, isn't it amazing how, how panicky the media is? Well, I mean, we, we've got a new variant. It's not even like here. But we're already scared, of, afraid of it, aren't we? I mean, it's just kind of whack how, how reactionary, and then they're going to lead people to be that reactionary. And they've already telling us that it appears this is a weaker, uh, a weaker variant, and it's not going to be nearly as deadly. So it appears it's going to be more like a flu. So, you know, if this thing just keeps staying with us, we're just going to have to learn to live with it, aren't we? We're going to have to learn to do ministry and do church with it. That's just the way it's going to be. We're just going to have to just plow on, right? And just not be so, oh, here we go again. The Omnicrom, is that what it's called? I had it down yesterday. I've forgotten since yesterday. Omnicrom, is that what it's called? And there's like two cases in the United States so far or something that they know about. So anyway, I'm, you know, fear God, not the virus. Amen? Just fear God, not the virus. Just, I, I know we all want to live and we don't want to do stupid stuff to, to get sick, but fear God. That's what God tells us to do. He also says that, we're, that in verse 4, that Jesus was born of a woman. Well, what is that a statement of? Why is it worded that way? Well, if you look at the humanity there, you know, biblically, most of the time you hear males being described in uh, the begats of the Old Testament. Here we have a clear statement, and this is back to the virgin conception. One of the nights that we do the, the, the study is we may spend a night talking about the virgin conception and why it's so important 
Um, I'm, I'm literally trying to do four subjects, but I got about 10 or 12 on my heart. <laughs> so I'm trying to decide which four am I going to share with you guys, and uh, we'll, we'll get there, okay? But we'll definitely be talking about the virgin conception. But this is obviously words about the virgin conception. Born of a woman. Doesn't say anything about a male. And that's because it shouldn't, right? So you don't know. You, you, you wonder how much knowledge does somebody that, you know, here he is writing Galatians. This is Paul. Does he have knowledge that she was... It was, that Jesus came born of a virgin was this common knowledge in that day and you could say maybe it was maybe it wasn't but obviously that that message would travel quick wouldn't it it would get around but what we do know is that he draws attention to this this birth is unique and if you're born and you do not have a man that's in the picture you are you have had an indeed a, a unique birth uh, just in that. Then God uses Paul to remind us that she, that Jesus was born under the law. Now that's important because the Bible makes it crystal clear as we read other books of the Bible that Jesus came to fulfill the law, didn't he? He didn't come as the scriptures bear record, even in the book of Galatians, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. In fact, I love the expression in the book of Galatians where it says Jesus was a schoolmaster. In other words, he was this instructor. And he was showing you how he came to fulfill the law. Now, we can't fulfill the law, can we? We're incapable. But a sinless son that has come from God Born without a man in the picture, the very seed of God, the Holy Spirit of God implanted that seed into the, the, the virgin or, or fertilized that egg of, of Mary. And you have a virgin uh, conception of a child, don't you? Where he is, there's not a man in the picture. And then he says, born under the law. I just wanted to draw your eye to that because it's important for us to see that. Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it and to show us how he would fulfill it. He's the only one that's ever existed that was fully obedient to the law and didn't sin not one single time. The Bible says that he was a man just like we are humans like us in every way, but there was one distinction about him in the living of his life. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us he lived his life without sin. He didn't sin one single time, did he? Not one single time. Hebrews really beats that message home. I want you to see something else too. And uh, here's just some Bible study, and we'll, we'll run through this. We've got about 13 minutes left. Jesus came to redeem all under the law. I was talking to somebody today, and they were talking to me about how different groups, different nationalities, different races, how they, they, they don't seem to have that message at the forefront of who they are as a people of God. And they were, they were telling me that that really disturbs them of how people get so, uh, just, just like with all the language about race today, of how we get so uh, tied in and focused there. But Jesus came to be the savior of the world, didn't he? Red, yellow, black, and white. I used to sing the song when I was a kid. Isn't that, isn't that in the Bible someplace? I never had so much fun when I was preaching in a, at a black church in Louisville, Kentucky. It was called uh, N Street Baptist Church. And the reason it was N Street, I mean it ended at Churchill Downs, the, the big horse park, you know, where they run the Kentucky Derby. But the church was on a street that it dead ended down, down there. Well, I went to school with this guy, and he told me that when he was a young man, 
when a white person was, was coming down the sidewalk, he'd step up against the store window or he'd step out in the street. He said, you know, I just had a, had a thing. I, was, I just thought white people were superior. He said, but I got over that. He said, I met Jesus and I found out, you know, he wasn't black, he wasn't white. He was Jewish, kind of like in the middle, kind of a brown guy himself. He said, not quite like me, but, and he said, I got over that. And uh, anyway, he just, he was a poetic preacher. And we invited his church to come down and bring their choir. And uh, we, uh, man, we just, they came down, they just had about 30 on the bus, but there was only, uh, I think about 12 in the choir. And man, they blew us out the windows. I mean, they just rocked the place. And next thing you know, I saw, pe I saw people dancing in my church that I never thought would ever do something like that. But they were swaying and singing, and they, they, I mean, we were just having a good time in the Lord. And I went, we went back up to, to End Street the next, uh, next uh, six months. We did this twice a year. They'd come down to our church, and then we'd go up to their church, and we'd, we'd do a, a, a lunch together, and then we'd do a Sunday night church service. So it was my turn to preach now. Well, Doug can preach, man. I mean, that, that man could preach. And those deacons got on those first three or four rows there, and they started sing-songing me. And next thing you know, I'm trying to preach like a black, black preacher. I mean, I, did, I wasn't trying. They just kind of get you. They just kind of pull you into it. Well, I had taken a handkerchief and tied a red handkerchief, a white handkerchief, a black handkerchief, and a, a yellow handkerchief together. And I had put it down in my coat pocket because I was preaching in a suit, I want you to know. And I had pulled the, the, uh, the uh, uh, handkerchiefs down to be under my watch. So I got to the end of my message. And I mean to tell you, I just reached under there and I started singing. God loves all the little children. Red. Yellow, I'm, it's <laughs> black and white. And then I just started dancing around. Doug Keir starts dancing around me up in the pulpit. And he's going, do it, Barry Jew, do it, Barry Jew. That's right, red, yellow, black, and white. Then the whole crowd starts. And the dude starts on the organ. And there it goes. I mean, it was awesome. It was revival breaking out. <laughs> Man, we had the best time. But you know, there's a truth in that little song, isn't there? God hasn't just saved a race. He came to the Jews first, but the Jews accepted him not. Made the gospel for the whole world is for the whole world all along. And he grafted all of us in. And it doesn't matter about your race. You see, the biggest commonality is that we are one human race. That's the teaching of Scripture. We're one human race. And on top of that, we need to understand that the biggest commonality we share in the human race is when you meet Jesus Christ face to face and he becomes your Lord and Savior and you know the forgiveness of sin, what happens to you is you become part of not just being a citizen of these United States, but you're an eternal citizen of the kingdom of God. That's forever and that will never go away. And when we all come into that family, you're talking about something that is incredible as a bond. Then race, language, ethnicity, background, all take a back seat to the commonality that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and being in his family. Amen? I mean, man, that is, that is just so much of what we need to always be sharing. I believe that message brings peace. It brings people together instead of all the separation of the emphasis of our differences. We need to emphasize what can make us one. And it's the gospel of Jesus, isn't it? Well, I'm getting to preaching, so I need to get back in, in the notes here, okay? Let me get back. <laughs> Jesus came to redeem all under the law. That's That word all set me off right there, all right? 
Sorry about that, but if you, if you chase the rabbit and catch it and make your way back, it's worth the trip. Amen? All right. The law condemns us, right? It condemns all of us. The law is not our friend. It shows us that we can't measure up to God, doesn't it? Exactly what Jesus was saying. Jesus took our condemnation, took our condemnation, fill that in, put the word took there. He took our condemnation when he came and went to the cross. Now I want to ask you something. Could you do what God did? Take your one and only son and sacrifice him? Just like we have in the story of Abraham and his son, Isaac. Remember that story in Genesis 22? So powerful. I, I bring that up. I mean, you say, well, God knew he was going to raise him from the dead. But he still knew that they were going to beat him where he was not recognizable. They're going to whip him with the cat of nine tails. They were, they were going to torture him on a cross. Any father, any mother would struggle to send their child there. They just would. Look at this third principle, and that is this. Jesus came so he could live in our hearts, couldn't he? Verse 6 says this. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son in our hearts. See, you have such a gift in God's spirit, don't you? The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. God's spirit takes up residence in you. He also came that we may know what God is like. Listen to that passage that we just read. Because you are sons, God spent, sent his spirit, and ladies, just put daughters there. Just put daughters. I know it's speaking in the male and the, and the masculine, but put yourself there because you are daughters. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit calls out, Abba, Father. Remember that statement in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23? He says, a virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him who? Emmanuel, God with us, which means God with us, right? God with us. When Jesus came, that's what happened. God made a way for God to be with you. Do you know that even when you're alone, you're not alone? When Christ comes in your life, you're never alone again. He's always with you. In the darkest, bleakest moment of your life, when you're being threatened by cancer or heartache of whatever kind, he's there, isn't he? Amen. His spirit has taken up residence in you. I want you to hear something else. Look at this passage in Matthew chapter 28. We call it the Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am what? Listen to this. It's a statement just like we have in other passages. And surely, I am what? With you always to the very end of the age. For your entire life and all of eternity, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. That all happened because of Christ coming to this earth and saving us from our sin. God is with you. You're never alone. Hebrews chapter 13. You don't believe that testimony? Listen to this one. <coughs> Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Isn't that a great passage? He left us, fill this in, he left us his spirit. He left us his spirit, didn't he? God's spirit lives in every single one of you. Not only did he come in the fullness of time, he came to indwell you, to have God live in you. We are here inside a church building, 
But that is not the abode of God. In the New Testament, He abides in you, His believers. He lives in you. Listen to this. I want to go to the book of John. I want to read verse chapter 14, verse 16 and 17. And then I want to jump down to verse 26. He says, I will ask the Father, Jesus said, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, I'm in verse 26, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Let me just give you this last thing, and that's this. Fourth, Jesus came to make us heirs in the kingdom. Have you ever thought about that? The Bible says we're going to judge the angels. Wow. We'll join God in judging the angels. Pretty, pretty high thing, huh? And if you're an heir, you're a son or a daughter, aren't you? It's coming to you. And literally, that's what it means. What does an heir mean? Well, it's the idea that, that, that you're going to inherit all that is the Father's, right? It's also that idea of being family. I want to tell you something. You, you can't tell me that there's a greater gift besides Jesus and the Holy Spirit on planet Earth than family. I don't care if your family bugs you at times. Family is such an incredible gift of Almighty God, isn't it? You've got this little cocoon of a group that hopefully you share the same ideology, you share Jesus, and then your, your blood, you are family. It's such an incredible relationship, isn't it? To be family to each other. Let me just turn this one last thing, and I'm, I'm going to go over just a minute or two, guys. Let's talk about the turning of history, and let's talk about B.C. and A.D. I just want to end with this, okay? We can wrap this up real quick. B.C. stands for before Christ. I want you to think about what Jesus did in his coming. The little baby in Bethlehem changed the world about how we measure time. Before Christ, it was such an incredible, crucial event that our very numbering of years changed because of Jesus. A.D., Anno Domini, it's Latin, and my Latin probably stunk in pronunciation just then. But Anno Domini means in the year of our Lord. It means the, in the year of our Lord. And I just wanted to remind you that everything that came after has been identified as being after the Lord, after he was here upon the earth. Jesus Christ split known time. Now, there are some secular places in the world, Russia and China, where they use another system of identification. But this is the system that's known to the world. Jesus so impacted planet Earth that he split time. B.C. and A.D. All about Jesus. How about that? I just wanted to throw that out tonight because, I'm, like I said, I'm going to do some things that talk about things we don't normally talk about at Christmas time. And on Wednesday night with my deeper Bible students, I can surely do this. So hopefully it's been worth, worth the, the journey. Jesus, think about it. He so altered the world, even though he was opposed, hated, fought against, censored, banned, and criticized for countless generations and continues to be. And yet his powerful gospel and his person continue to change lives. And, can change, and change our world. And even though the church in the United States has been suffering some decline, I'm so glad to tell you that there are places in South America that the church is just busting loose. There are places in Africa that if salvations continue, they tell us the entire continent will come to Christ within the next 20, 25 years. Isn't that amazing? 
I mean, just on fire for God. Places in Asia that there are con- tremendous works going on. What continues to go on in South Korea, just right there across the border from North Korea and all of what's going on there, there is incredible gospel ministry. Some of the greatest and largest churches that have ever existed on planet Earth, right there in South Korea, multiple ones. It's kind of amazing. You see, our Lord is still large and in charge, and he is going to bring it all home. And don't lose hope in these days that we're going through a pandemic, and it's all like, what, another variant? You know what? He's going to get us through. He's got us through already 21 months. Amen? He'll get us through. Hey, this Sunday's going to be neat. Global Impact Ministries will really be featuring them uh, Sunday. Preacher's going to preach a really short message. You ought to show up just for that, see if it could really happen. Uh, our music folks, going they're, they're really dialing it down. But we're going to give plenty of time so you can talk and meet our... Uh, some of them are right here in our church, uh, all of the Wycliffe and is it... Help me, Gene. Is it ISL? SIL. S-I-L. Okay, I always, I get it wrong. <laughs> so some of them belong to the other organization. But anyway, it'll, it'll be a neat time in the Lord. Hey, I'm Barry Jude. We've gone a few minutes over. Uh, I know our band's not rehearsing tonight, so that gave me a little more freedom and uh, to go on a little while. They usually start at 7.30. But God bless you. Thanks for joining us. Love to have you in person, 9 o'clock, 10.30, and our Spanish service at uh 12 noon. We'd love to see you here.